Hello and welcome back to TGTV and more specifically, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Watch Talk. Now I want to kick off this revitalised series with an apology. You may remember if you saw my last Watch Talk episode that the sound was completely off, the production was off and I completely screwed it up. I was left to my own devices with that episode uh, and I actually filmed in here but I didn't realise the sound was so bad until I did it post-edit. I didn't have time to refilm the episode so I just shoved it out anyway. However, I've now got a proper team on board and we're now filming this series properly going forward. There's going to be close-ups of the watches and there's going to be less of my face, which most of you will be very appreciative of. And there will also be sound that you can actually hear properly, which is great. We're going to kick off with a bang then and we're going to tackle some new watches into my collection. I've been very busy during lockdown buying watches and I've added a load to the collection, some of which are actually pretty obscure. Now, some of you will have seen some of the pieces knocking around on my Instagram. Some of them you won't have done because I keep them undercover. Some of you well done. So the first one, we're going to kick off with a bang. I have finally bought a Richard Mill. So I actually had a Richard Mill in 2016, but this is new to my collection and it sits in front of me right here. We've got some other detritus on the table here. We've got my Rapport watch winder, which I keep my Richard Mill in when I'm kind of wearing it fairly regularly. I keep it topped up in there. I featured Rapport products many, many times on the channel and I also transport my watches around in their kind of travel roles as well. However, we're not here to talk about watch winding. We may do it at some point during the, uh, the movement chat. Let's get in here. We've got the paperwork here, which we'll go into as well, because Richard Mille do it slightly differently to normal brands. Here we go then, a little unboxing. We love an unboxing. Let's uh, you go over there. It's not gonna be completely professional, by the way. We're not gonna, we're gonna lose that, that kind of unprepared element of it. So, inside here, we have a tonneau-shaped box. Go away, it's like Blue Peter. Now, I wanna preface this. I've gone for a slightly obscure RM. Uh, a model that is often not seen. It's, I think it's a really, really unsung hero. It's a very cool, clever watch. You never see them about. They didn't sell that many of them comparatively and it's now been discontinued and it's about half the price of a normal uh, kind of tonneau shaped RM from the same era. So, shut up Tom, just show you the watch. Inside then, do you want that? RM cardboard, 200 quid, do you want it? Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Be careful with that. So that's the, that! Probably the nicest box I've ever come across. Are you happy with me shoving stuff over there? I've got company in here, by the way. Ollie's back on the channel behind the lens. Hello. Uh, and we've got Jamie as well. Jamie's in here. Jamie's not being seen on the channel. Jamie, are you going to make a noise? Mm. Fine. Here we go then. Here is my RM016 or RM16 as uh, normal people would probably call it. So let's get it out of its little uh, holster. What we've got here then, this is actually often referred to as the ultra flat. This is a slight departure in design for Richard Mille. This watch actually originally came out, I think in 2007, possibly 2006, it was announced and shown around the same time as the RM11, which is a famous, famous watch for them. And they've now obviously updated the shape to the RM1103. However, at the point at which they were doing the chronograph stuff with uh, Philippe Massa, they also brought out this, an ultra flat rectangle case. It is a thin case with an automatic self-winding movement. It's got a date aperture at seven o'clock and a skeletonized movement. Now, that all sounds fairly standard, but Richard Mill being Richard Mill, there are a load of really, really clever bits and bobs. Before we get into this then, and what I think these are gonna do value-wise, because you all care about that, don't we all? We're going to get into some history. We're going to have a history lesson about Richard Mill. So Richard Mill was born in 1951. He started actually uh, studying marketing, which is very telling now, considering the success of the brand. He started his career in about 1974 in watchmaking. He was actually became manager of kind of uh, watch companies and worked in the watch industry uh, and actually became a shareholder in a French watch firm uh, and jewelry company. He was kind of mastering his art and learning about watches and making contacts in the watch industry at the point at which he met Giulio Papi, the guy behind the creative director and research guy at Audemars Piget. And fluffing forward a few years, you know, conversations with him and kind of whatever, whatever, Richard Mille actually wanted to start his own watch brand and he started his brand in 1999. And his aim was to come into the industry and use cutting edge materials, cutting edge design, and kind of really kind of shake up the watch industry, the traditional um, shapes and cases but with cutting edge design and also really pioneer amazing movements and amazing technologies and amazing materials. What many people don't realize is that Audemars Piguet were actually a shareholder, a minority shareholder in RM. So they were contributing a lot of their tech, a lot of their high-end movements and a lot of their know-how into the development. So in 2001, then the brand's main legal entity, Horometry SA, was actually founded and headquartered in Switzerland, very close to La Chaux de Fonds, 
which is a very, very famous watchmaking town. And if you are French or can speak French or you're Swiss, uh, please do not get offended at my pronunciation. I am British, we, uh, we're not good at these things. So then at this point, as I said before, Audemars Piget, uh, Renault et Papi, which was their kind of uh, their development company, their research department with uh, Mr. Giulio Papi behind it all, was actually behind their um, split second chronographs, their tourbillons and all their kind of like really complicated madness stuff. So Audemars Piget were really, really, as you know them today, were instrumental about 20 odd years ago in the founding of RM. And many people don't know that, which I didn't actually really know until recently, until I was looking into this watch and I was like, do I really want one of these? Are they a fad? Are they a proper brand? Um, and yes, they are. Since then, of course, Richard Mille have been kind of instrumental in changing the watch world almost on kind of an annual basis with a new model coming out. And they've become famous for partnering up with high profile athletes from tennis players like Rafael Nadal to polo players like Pablo Madonahue. I don't know if I've said that right. Bubba Watson, the golf player, um, even high jumpers, I've forgotten his name. Johan Blake, the sprinter. There's loads more. There are loads more. I've just forgotten them. Who else are they? Nadal. Oh, I've said Nadal. Maka. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lando Norris. Lando Norris, yeah, they're involved with McLaren now, aren't they? Yeah, Roman Grosjean. Roman Grosjean. He just got fired. I was going to say, I'd probably probably get that back off him. Uh, <laughs> so they are partnering with basically just kind of heads of industry other than um, Mr. Grosjean. But that's, that's been the key to their success. And a lot of racing teams they kind of get involved in, they're kind of famously known for not necessarily even providing funding to the team. They actually just give everyone a watch instead of money. That's how kind of well regarded their watches are. Um, I don't know how true that is across all racing teams, um, but certainly that is the case on, uh, in, in one or two examples for sure. Really, really cool brand. And the way they've approached the marketing side of things has just been a game changer. And it's really catapulted them into being just the watch to have. You know, you can't listen to a, and I know this isn't a kind of a barometer of whether or not something's desirable, but you can't listen to like a rap song without hearing about Richard Mille. It's even known as the billionaire's handshake. Although that is uh, soon to go down the Swanee with me wearing one of these about. But yeah, they are kind of, there is no brand now like Richard Mille really, even Patek. Um, some of the Patek models, you know, you look like a poor relative compared to someone wearing an RM, which is mental. So many of you will know then what RM have been up to over the past few years. You know, they're making cases out of sapphire, mad carbon stuff. Uh, they're making tourbillon movements suspended on cables. Uh, Raphael Nadal's new piece that looks like strings on a tennis racket. They're just up to all sorts. And they've recently just brought out the RM53, I think, in sapphire, which is the Pablo Madonna um, polo player version but with a sapphire case, which I don't know how well that works in a polo game, but presumably I have thought about that. Talking about all those very kind of clever high-end watches, this is actually pretty much kind of like a staple piece. This is the piece to RM um, that the maybe the Nautilus 5711 is to Patek. It is their kind of just uh, simple, as simple as an RM gets, simple date and time piece. There's no split seconds, there's no chronograph, there's no tourbillons, uh, there's no minute repeaters, there's no madness like that. It's literally just a date and time. But as you'd expect, it is highly, highly skeletonized. And it's also got what's called a variable geometry rotor. The power reserve is circa 55 hours, and they say even on their website, plus or minus 10%, so they've allowed themselves plenty of scope there. But the base plate and bridges are made of grade five titanium, a biocompatible, highly corrosion resistant, remarkably rigid alloy, which enables the gear train to function effortlessly. The alloy is 90% grade five titanium, 6% aluminium, and 4% vanadium. This combination further increases the material's mechanical properties, which explains its frequent use in the aerospace, aeronautics, and automobile industries. Definitely didn't read that bit. The skeletonized base plate and the bridges were subjected to intensive and complete validation tests to optimize their resistance capacities. And that's the other thing about RM's partnerships with all these uh, athletes like Nadal, they actually give them development pieces to wear in the field. So the high jump bloke was jumping around with kind of development uh, RMs on. Um, Nadal broke several of his prototype watches whilst developing um, various Nadals now that have come out since uh, their partnership with him. And he even recently just won Roland Garros with the brand new Nadal RM on his wrist. Chaos. Now, even the rotor in the back isn't just a simple piece of metal that just swings around in there. It is a variable geometry rotor, which means the arm is in grade five titanium. The weight segment is 18 karat white gold. And the weight segment also has six possible positions adjusted by screws in grade five titanium. Bit of a mouthful, this. It's also got 18 karat white gold wings, 
high palladium content, ceramic ball bearings, uh, lubricating the whole uh, movement of the rotor, and it's got a unidirectional anti-clockwise winding direction. And this is exclusive to Risha Mill, which makes it possible to effectively adapt rewinding of the mainspring to the user's activity level in sporting or non-sporting environments. Effectively, without any garb then from the website or otherwise, it means that if you were a very sedentary person, you're sat around with your RM, or, uh, your desk being very busy and important, um, you can actually adjust the movement or get your watchmaker to adjust the movement to suit that, to make the most of the power reserve and to also make the most of the movement and prolong its life. And alternatively, if you're playing tennis in it or just knocking around or wrestling or rock climbing or whatever it is you want to do and it's taking a load of knocks and you're moving around the whole time, you can also adjust the movement to reflect that as well. Really, really clever stuff and not something you would instantly know that could be done and not something that I'm probably even going to bother adjusting. I mean, I'm going to take it for service at some point and probably just let them know that I do just sit around quite a lot. So something that if you've got one of these, worth bearing in mind. And I think the movement is shared in the RM05 as well, possibly. So, uh, or RM10, no, it's the 05. Before we go into pricing then and what finishes you can get this in, I just want to touch on the date as well. So you can see through the seven o'clock marker, there is a date that just appears where the seven should be. That's not simple, as you'd expect. None of the watch is actually simple once you start looking into it. It's actually a sapphire disc inside the movement, which is treated to anti-reflective coating on the front and the back. So that is a glass disc that is put in there. Again, adding to the skeletonization of the movement, you can pretty much see through most of it. You can see every cog, you can see the mainspring, you can see the balance, you can see everything moving around in there. When you wind it, when you adjust the time, when you pull the keyless works out, you can see everything. It's really, really cool. Finishes then, as I said before, this is discontinued. You can no longer get it in this kind of red or rose gold uh, configuration. I believe you can probably still get it with diamonds on it, but you definitely can't go in and order one of these anymore. This particular watch is dated 24th of March, 2008. You get all the serial numbers and whatnot written, handwritten on this um, piece of paper here. And interestingly, what Richard Mill are doing now with their warranties, it's out of warranty now anyway, you get two years when you buy the watch from brand new. And as I say, it was from 2008, about 10 years out. But when you get it serviced by RM, you will get some form of warranty on that service with it. Now a service for one of these, and I've looked into it recently because I don't think the power reserve is exactly where it needs to be. I think it's a few hours out. So maybe we'll just leave it for the time being. Um, but a service is about three grand and they will also include a uh, case refinishing in that as well. Now, I'm a bit weird. I don't care that there's scratches on it. I actually kind of prefer them a little bit scratched, meaning you can wear them and you baby them a little bit less. And if you do scratch it, you don't just think you're throwing three grand down the toilet. So I'm more than happy with it scratched, wearing it around with some minor scratches on it, I must say. Um, but yeah, a service is three grand. So it's about the same cost as uh, servicing an SV pretty hellish but I think you probably only need to do that maybe every five years or so or maybe less. What Richard Mille now though are doing when you buy a brand new watch from them they give you the warranty and the warranty is attached to you as the person not the watch so if you go into RM you buy a watch you flip it it's instantly out of warranty because if the person comes in and said oh, the crown's fallen off they'll say okay mate who are you they give their name across and they say well warranty's not in your name mate so get out so I guess if you do flip one of these, then just tell the person you flipped it to to um, give it back to you if they've got any issues with it. But that is one of the things that Richard Miller are doing because their watches sell for huge, huge overs now, most of their models anyway. And that's one of the things they're doing to try and counteract that trade. I am at the moment trying to get myself on the list for a 6702 and their new 72 flyback chronograph. Uh, I'm trying to get myself in for both of those, not to flip, there's better models to flip to be honest with you. Um, I wanted a 55 Bubba Watson and I went to the store the other day and they said they've literally just discontinued it. So um, I'm gonna have to buy used if I want a Bubba Watson, but retail on a Bubba is about 110, 120 grand um, from the boutique. Uh, and on the used market, kind of horrible gray market dealers, they're about 160, 170 grand. Um, so there's a huge discrepancy in prices and I'm not doing the whole overs game, I refuse. So I may well get the thin, um, the high jump matey boy, what is this name? So the high jump watch then is the Mutar SM Barshim, the, uh, the high jumping bloke who's got an RM named after him is the dark pink one, I'll put it on the screen. And the 72 is their new in-house flyback chronograph with some mad oscillating stuff. Uh, and all the tech specs for those are online, so go and bore yourself to death with that. Um, but basically RM have created this amazing in-house chronograph, it's absolute chaos. And the interesting thing to note about that and why those tie in and why I like them is because they are thinner, they're smaller and they're getting back towards kind of a smaller, more retro style of watch, which is 
where Richard Mill was originally going with this piece back in 2006, 2007 when it was released. So they are going back this way. A lot of the new models are going back this way. Uh, and I think this is a really nice piece of Richard Mill history made in very few numbers. Now, market value on this piece, they range between nearly 50K and kind of 65K for one of these, if you can find them. There is one on Chrono24, I think, at the moment in gold, but that's the one that I actually have bought. So they just left the listing up there, I think, hawking for new business. So as far as I know, there aren't any of these available online anywhere. And when you consider that the model that's the same as this, just with the tonneau case shape, the RMO5, is about 60, 70 grand, maybe more, maybe even 80 if you want a gold one, um, and seemingly going up by the day, this looks like pretty good value and the RM5s were hugely popular watches in comparison so there's a lot more of those about. I think there's something cool and unique about these as well the fact there's not many rectangle RMs around and there are loads of tonneau shaped RMs so if you've got the 005 or the 05 whatever it's called you're going to look like you've just bought the cheap one but this you've kind of bought something that's deliberately a bit different in my mind anyway maybe I've just rationalized being a bit of a cheapskate but I think this is a really really cool piece I'm actually going to put it on why am I not wearing it in the video silly me We'll be talking about this one in a video as well, boys and girls. So, you know, stay tuned for that one. Stay tuned, stay tuned. Both on grey rubber, actually. I've got a penchant for grey rubber. That reminds me, actually. You've obviously got this really thick, nice deployment clasp, uh, very heavily spring-loaded. Um, quite difficult to get off, which is just as well if you're walking around Mayfair, because you will be stabbed in the throat for it. So, inside here, actually, in this rather battered travel case, which I got with the watch. So, we've got straps. Go away, you're for a Langer and Son. Not today, mate, or today, but that'll be coming soon. So I got with a watch, this croc strap. This is what my watch originally came on, and if I can find some original photos of it, I'll whack it on the screen now, uh, but it came on this brown croc. Really don't like it. It's a different vibe, uh, it doesn't suit me at all. I don't wear croc strap watches really at all. Rarely, 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 unless I'm wearing like a dinner jacket or a suit or a tux or whatever, whatever, and then I wouldn't wear an RM with a, with a tux. So that came off straight away, and I think if you wanted to buy one of those straps for about 700 quid, maybe about a grand, ridiculous pricing for straps in, in Richard Mill. It's probably where they make most of their money. And also when I was in the boutique the other day buying this grey rubber, uh, which coincidentally cost me 400 quid, 450 thereabouts, I also got a green Velcro strap as well. Just to rustle a few jimmies, I've gone for a green Velcro. Again, you rarely see these, and when you do, you just don't see them on Velcro at all. A lot of people run them on a croc, because they came on a croc, I think, uh, from factory, um, but you never see them on Velcro, let alone green. Probably with good reason, because it'll look horrendous. Um, but yeah, there we go. I've got green Velcro with it as well. So yeah, cool watch. I absolutely love it. it. I've got very skinny wrists, but it does fit around quite nicely on my skinny wrists. As I say, it sits quite thin. So it's not so bad. Um, I was actually wearing this watch in Santorini. And you know what? Unless you're a really kind of nerdy watch guy, you wouldn't necessarily clock that it was an RM, which I quite like as well, purely from a security perspective. Um, the big kind of tonneau shaped case watches, uh, they're very, very synonymous with RM. But this goes under the radar as much as a kind of a 48 millimeter cased gold Richard Mill watch can do does tend to go under the radar a little bit. It can look to the untrained eye a little bit, kind of uh, maybe just on the cheap or gimmicky side, um, which suits me. That's fine by me. I really honestly don't care. Um, I'd rather not everyone knew what it was, although I'm now putting on the internet. What do I think these are gonna do values wise? If RM continued their kind of ascension to uh, stardom and just continually going up almost week on week price wise, and they continue to limit supply and really drill into who they're selling to, uh, which they really do. As I say, I went in on, uh, to get on the list uh, very recently for a couple of new models, and they really drilled into me. They kind of got my name down. Uh, they look into what company you work at. They wanna make sure that you are not a watch trader. You're not someone that sells watches for a living, and you're not gonna flip it. There is rumor that they're going to move into selling pre-owned watches as well. So they're gonna try and control the used market as well. So they're gonna have a boutique fairly soon, I think in London, selling used RM pieces, but with factory warranty on them, which is really cool. Uh, and obviously reconditioned up to factory standards, which again is aiming to kind of capitalize on the used market because there's guys out there making more from selling RMs than RM are making on them in the first place or about the same margin, which is absolutely bonkers. And as a company with a board of shareholders, um, that's quite a difficult thing to explain. So they are being quite smart with it and good on them. They're keeping the value of their pieces there. And I think um, what I paid, I paid early 40s for this, which I think doesn't represent too bad a value. You can have this 
or you know an aquanaut which is looking relatively boring these days and um, with every tom dick and harry jumping into patek and waving them around in white city house so i don't think it's a bad buy i think it's cool because you know apart from running costs aside um, you know, you want to replace the clasp on it or something, it's hell. If you want to get the movement fixed, it can be hell because the only parts available are from Richard Mill and it can take a while. But if you want to take all that on the chin and you're not going to wear it daily, I think it is a really cool sports watch and something you're just not going to see anyone else wearing unless you're unfortunate enough to bump into me wearing it. And before I go, I also want to cover a very boring admin related question about watches. Living in London and it's degenerating into a hell hole. I'm aware of that and I've just done a podcast on it. Um, but security wise, insurance wise, I insure all my watches with First Point. They actually do my contents insurance on my properties and they will insure my watches as an add on. And it's nowhere near as expensive as you might think. I've tried specific watch insurance before in the past and it's worked out way more expensive, way more um, constricting, way more like ridiculous conditions. So yeah, give First Point a go. They also insure my fleet of supercars as well. Very well versed with First Point. Good bunch of eggs as well. And the guy at the top there, uh, I won't mention his name, but he'll probably be watching this. He collects watches as well, so he's truly, truly into it. Anyway, on that note, I think I'm going to disappear. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this return episode to Watch Talk. Please, please do leave me your feedback. I'm doing more of these. I'm going to be putting out at least one a month or maybe one every three weeks. I've got three more niche pieces with me today to talk about, which I'm going to be filming today with this level of quality and this level of depth. So hopefully you've enjoyed this. I'm aware these don't do the huge views on YouTube, um, but that's not what this is about. I love watches. I love them just as much as cars. So I'm going to talk about them as well. However, I will be wearing a different t-shirt so just to fox some of you and throw some of you off the scent. I haven't just been churning them all out in one afternoon. Anyway, thank you very much. Do subscribe, blah, blah, blah. I'll see you all very soon. Bye.